What you're about to hear was originally published on the From This Day Forward podcast. As that podcast has been folded into this one, we're republishing the episode here on Northwoods Church Matters. We hope you enjoy it and are edified by it. God bless. You're listening to Northwoods Church Matters, a podcast of Northwoods Church in Evansville, Indiana, where we discuss why the local church matters and things that matter to the local church. I'm your host, Matt Higgins. I'm here with our other biblical counselor on staff, Ms. Karen Hauer. Karen, when did you get your certification in biblical counseling? I just got certified as of the beginning of this year, so January 2021. Awesome. That's great. And you've been seeing lots of people right now. Yes, it's been very busy the last month or so. Plenty to do. <laughs> There's plenty to do. Always people with problems. And that's <laughs> that's what keeps us in business is that sin is in the world and therefore people always have problems. Yep, that's true. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that Karen and I talk a lot in the office as the two biblical counselors on staff about people and issues with the past. And I feel like this is a really common issue that people have, is someone who has trouble dealing with their past. So why is this so problematic for people, the people that say, well, I just can't get over the past? For one thing, we all have a past. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So problems or issues from the past, if we don't deal with them biblically, they don't just go away. The Bible talks about our heart a lot, which includes our thoughts, our desires, Our choices, and these aspects don't just appear out of thin air, they are molded over time and they have a history. You know, we all have patterns of doing life, and then time goes forward and maybe the difficult person or situation is in the past and finished, but those effects can be carried in our memories and in our thinking. Maybe what happened in the past planted so much hurt and shame or unforgiveness that we don't even know how to work through that or how to let go of it. And maybe we never even told anyone else what happened. There's there's many factors that could be the cause of that. But the main point is that if sin is not dealt with, it doesn't just go away. Yeah. I, I think one heart attitude that people often have is that memory is a curse. That I, I can still remember all these bad things that happen and it's just a curse that hangs over me. But I, I really think that if you look at scripture, you know, God intends us and gives us memory for good purposes. I mean, everything that God gives us is good. He could create us like a guinea pig or a gerbil, and and (laughs) we just suddenly forget everything that we're thinking about. I mean, some days that would really be nice to 20 minutes ago. Some days it would be nice. think, what am I doing? (laughs) Although I do say that a lot. But God gives us memories to reinforce the positive. This was a good experience. We went to the beach with the family. We had right. close bonding time. And so those good memories help us reinforce, okay, this was a good experience. We should do that again. Right. And then God also gives us negative memories often for a, a good purpose. You're standing in the middle of the street with your friends and you're playing skee ball or <laughs> stick ball or what have you. And then a car almost runs you over. You, you think twice before playing in the street again. Yeah, it helps you learn as you go forward. Sure. And if we didn't have memory, then we'd do the same things over and over again. We'd kind of be like a mouse that's stuck in a maze and the mouse can't figure out intuitively where to go because it's just running around lost inside this maze. Yeah, that's I mean, a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. God gives us memory for good purposes. So what are some of the past issues that people often have trouble getting over? Uh, There's a lot of possibilities here. I'll just list a few things. Loss of a loved one, cases of abuse, a season of suffering, difficult relationships, financial losses, an accident, maybe a missed opportunity. There's a lot. And I think this whole thing is going to unveil our heart idol. So whatever people struggle with often unveils kind of what we think inwardly. If somebody is struggling with I didn't get that promotion as a real basic one. Sure. Or I'm not getting acknowledged at work like I should. Sometimes that reveals the hard issue of maybe you're overly obsessed with work and you've placed work above God and that becomes your idol in your life. So the past has a way of revealing heart idols. Yep. Things that are too important to us. Yeah. And it can be very tragic and it's not putting that down. I mean, the young woman who's raped, for example, there's a real loss that's there. Sure. 
a physical loss, but also the relational loss and also expectations. Oh, sure. We all have expectations, good and bad, for life. Mm -hmm. And often when trauma or the past comes in our life and messes things up, it messes with our expectations for, this is the way I think the world should be. Right. And it really is our past screwing up our expectations for the present or the future. Mm -hmm. So why do people have trouble dealing with the past and others don't? Well, some of what you just mentioned flows right into this question as far as expectations. And so I think it depends on a lot on how we think about the past, how we think about people, ourselves, the world around us. Romans 8 tells us that we have a choice as to how we think about things. We can set our mind on the flesh or we can set our mind on the spirit. Uh, so a biblical perspective would be subject to God's guidelines, and that would look like forgiveness, trusting God's character, praying for difficult people. Are we willing to do life God's way and trust him, or are we going to do it our way? And then insist on that, which that could exemplify itself as unforgiveness, bitterness, fear, trying to control other people. I'm not saying that trusting God and doing life his way is always easy, mm. but I think our thinking and beliefs drive our attitudes and our actions. So those who are going to align their thinking with the word of God can experience freedom and victory over the past. And those who try to do it their own way may end up struggling more. Yeah. It, it's, sometimes it's just an obedience issue, right? That exactly. You're just not doing the disciplines that you should, and you're not following Christ as you should. And it may be just that one corner of your life that you've just kind of wedged away. And you're just saying, okay, I'm not going to allow God to work in, the, in that part of my life. So there's often a choice. Do I really want to follow God or do I not want to follow God? And Romans 8 is a great example of that. We all have the, the choice daily to crucify our flesh. Yep. Or to walk in the spirit. Oftentimes, me too. I choose walking in the flesh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot of times. I understand. <laughs> yeah. As we go forward with this, I think there's an important distinction between past issues that are caused by our own sin or other sin, or there's just past issues that are generated by general brokenness from living in a broken world. How does this distinction or categorization of the past guide how we respond to the past. Yeah, I think that's a very important distinction, whether we are more of an innocent party or whether we are guilty. If I am guilty, something in the past I've done, my sin requires that I ask forgiveness of God and I repent. So, and the other part of that too is I can actually lean on and depend on God's promise of forgiveness instead of wondering, does he ever forgive me for this? And the other side of it is if I was innocent and something happened, you know, like you said, the world is very broken. In these instances, I would have less control or choice involved, but I can learn to face it honestly and biblically. That may involve trusting God even when I don't understand why. Mm. Well, I think sometimes these things can merge, right? Like there's, a, there's certain situations where it's not just an issue of your sin or just general brokenness in the world. It's like multiple things going on at the same time and you have to figure out, okay, what part of the past do I do what with? If I got into a severe car accident and it was not my fault. I mean, that's caused by possibly other people's sinfulness or just general brokenness in the world. Bad things happen. But th then if I'm severely injured from that and I start getting angry with my wife or lashing out at my kids or making poor life choices based on the fact that I had this accident, now I'm on top of the fact that I've been sinned against, I'm sinning against other people, and I have to take responsibility for that. For the counselor or for a parent or for somebody who's going through this, you have to figure out, okay, what is my sin and what is other people's sin and how do I really extrapolate all this stuff out? So how does the character of God help us to deal with the past? I have found personally, but also helping other people, that this aspect is very important in dealing with the past. As I look back over life, I have to trust that God is sovereign. In other words, he's in charge of everything and everyone and everything that happens. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. But also wrapped into that, he can be trusted. In other words, he's good and everything he does is right and good. He is all powerful. He guides me. He comforts me. And so thinking on different aspects of God's character can really be an anchor when you're troubled with things from the past. I also 
think about Romans 8, 28, that everything that has happened to me has come through God's filter, through his caring and loving hands. The world is broken. It's full of broken people and evil. And although God does not wish bad things to happen to me, he may allow situations so that I, one, learn to depend on him more, and two, so I have opportunity to become more like Jesus, his son. If we never had difficult things happen, I think we would never be reminded to run to him. And that Romans 8.28 part, is it's hard, right? It is. I mean, it, especially somebody who's experienced real deep trauma, that theological truth of Romans 8.28 is nonetheless true. But trying to help people see that can be really difficult in that circumstance. It's challenging. It's challenging. They've got all that hurt. There's an illustration that I've gotten from the book Gentle and Lowly. I keep talking about this on the podcast because it's just a great book. I'm going to have to read that book. It's, it's fantastic. But it's talking about the character of God and how sinners can come to him. And I extrapolated this illustration and I've used it in counseling that I think the worst thing in the world is dog vomit. <laughs> there, there's like nothing worse than dog vomit. Like in, in my dog in particular, we have hardwood floors in the house and then we have a carpet. 10 out of 10 times, my dog will want to barf on the carpet, which is just, yeah, it's, it's just gross. <laughs> and it's one of those things where, you know, I'm going to clean it up, but I don't like doing it. And I don't like the person that made the mess very much. I mean, it makes me angry, but I, it's just a situation I have to fix because I'm responsible. Right. And oftentimes we think of God like that. God is responsible for us. But what we do makes him severely angry, and it's a chore for him to help us clean up our lives. Ah. But God really isn't like that. The character of God is that he wants us to approach the throne of grace with confidence, as it talks about in Hebrews 4. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants us to come to him with problems in a very fatherly way. And I think a lot of people with past issues, they really think of themselves as really reminiscent of dog vomit. Like they are the thing that is really hard to clean up and God doesn't really want to touch them or associate yes. with them. That's definitely not true. And I think that's good about the character of God. So if we are in Christ, how does Jesus deal with our past? So the fact that Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and rose again to show that he had power over sin and death is great news for beginning our relationship with him. But also there's something that us counselors talk about the sustaining gospel, which is the same message, but applied to everyday life. So when we're dealing with the past, thinking about how Jesus can help us do what we are unable to do, he can, for one, forgive our personal sin if we have been guilty in the past. And so he asks us to repent and he forgives us. He can heal our hurts. That is, there's a process involved in that, but he very much wants to heal he can heal relationships. He can help us find new ways of thinking about the past, both circumstances and people. He makes his mercy and grace, love and peace, and many other things available to us personally. I think of Isaiah 61, and I'd like to read just the first few verses because it's a great description of part of what Jesus' job description is for us. Yeah. And I think it's beautiful. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Just that trade where we can trade in our past, our troubles, and he replaces it with beautiful things. Mm, that's awesome. And I think one of the things that's interesting about that passage that's good to remember is that was the last verse say that the Lord may be glorified, right? Yes. And so when God helps sinners, he is glorified. If you have past issues, it's not for you to just dump those out. It's for you to run to God with those things because God wants to help you. And I think that verse is just a great proof of, of what we were just talking about. God is glorified when he helps people. When you keep your problems and your past to yourself, 
for one, you're not acknowledging a theological reality that God knows about all your problems already. Right. Yeah, And you can't hide those from him. <laughs> and so why try to hide them? But God is glorified when you approach the throne of grace with confidence and you come to him in, in your hour of need and you present all those things to him that he needs to fix because he's a loving father and he cares for you. Right. Yeah, exactly. Who are some biblical characters that had past issues and how are they able to overcome their past issues? So I chose two, one from the Old Testament, one from the New. So Joseph has a great story in the book of Genesis. Mm. His past issues were hurtful and abusive people, very unfair circumstances. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was falsely accused by his employer's wife. He was forgotten in prison by someone who promised to ask for his release. The key, I think, to his great attitude is found in Genesis 50, verse 20, where he says that people had intended to harm him, but God had a plan and was using his life for good. So there again, we see God's sovereignty. And Joseph trusted God to care for him no matter what happened. Hmm. Uh, I also can notice in his story that Joseph continued to do what was right, even in the middle of really tough circumstances. He knew that God was ultimately in charge, even in his suffering, mm. and he forgave the people who had hurt him. Yeah. Just because the Bible says something is true doesn't mean it's easy. Right. What we've talked about with Romans 8.28 and the story of Joseph, that what people intended for evil, God meant for good, that's a hard thing sometimes, especially when you've got death or assault or abuse or rape or really difficult things. The challenge of counseling often is to try to teach people truth of Scripture, but also be caring while we do that. We don't just want to throw out those niceties that somebody walks into the counseling office for the first time and says, you know, I've been sexually assaulted or I've been molested as a child and say, well, God's going to use that for good. That doesn't seem caring to just throw that out there. No, it's not caring. It (laughs) seems like cheap advice, really. I mean, I think about peanuts and Lucy, 25 (laughs) cents the the counselor's in. That's the type of thing that that Lucy would say. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I think Joseph is a great example of that. His stuff was real. It's not just a nice story. I mean, he was in jail for a long time and his family put him there. Just the grudges that he should have held against them. He had a lot of time, I'm sure, to think about those things. Oh, yeah. Wrestle wrestle with those things. Yeah. It wasn't like jail today where they get to watch the cooking channel or (laughs) whatever they do. (laughs) Nope. The second example was Zacchaeus. So, we find him in the New Testament. He was a tax collector, which means he probably cheated people out of their money. Back in those days, tax collectors were known by the people to be liars and cheats. But one day, he saw Jesus and followed him to see what was going on, and Jesus ended up coming to his house that day to eat dinner. So, after Zacchaeus was with Jesus, he becomes very aware of his sin, and he repents. His life changed that very day because he immediately made plans to repay the people that he had cheated. He wanted to do life differently in that he wanted to give instead of take. Mm. So, here, this character is more about his guilty past and what he decides to do, where where Joseph, you see more of an innocent, things happen to someone who was more innocent. Yeah. And I think the key for if you have sinned in your past, right, is just to repent and and turn to the Lord and surrender those things to him. And I think that you can have a relationship with Jesus just like Zacchaeus did, that Zacchaeus got tight with Jesus. Jesus didn't shy away from him. I mean, going over to somebody's house, that's a big deal. Even back then, I mean, you don't invite just anybody over to your house unless you're a a teenager throwing a party. (laughs) I mean, you're you're usually pretty selective who you invite over and you clean up the house and make sure it looks nice and prepare nice food and everything else. That's a big deal today, but it also is a big deal back then. It meant that you wanted to associate or be friends with somebody. And so for Jesus to go over to somebody's house, the sign in a gesture of friendship, I think that Jesus wants to have the same type of relationship with us. Yes. And definitely. when it talks about in Psalm 23 that we will dine at the, the table of the Lord forevermore. Mm-hmm. That's a great imagery of God wants and desires friendship with us, even us as wicked sinners. Yes. And so that's amazing. Yeah. So if you're listening to this and you've got past and you, you think, man, I'm just dog vomit and God doesn't want to touch me or have anything to do with me or I'm less than or I'm not good enough to be part of the kingdom of heaven, look at the story of Zacchaeus and mm-hmm. going over to his house, dining with him is what 
God desires from you. That's a good picture there. So one of the common pieces of advice that's given is that, quote unquote, time heals all wounds. And I've heard this not only in the non-Christian setting, but in a Christian setting as well. This is actually a piece of advice that when my wife's mom died, she heard a lot. She was often offended by that, that give it a year, oh. you'll get over it. Oh, no. Uh, so does really time help us overcome the past? Time alone does not heal the past. Time may seem to remove some wounds, but I think it really just pushes them out of sight, yeah. like out of our immediate attention span. There could still be harmful consequences that continue. So then when something happens that could prompt a memory, or maybe we see a person that you know mistreated us, or whatever the case, that hurt is right there still, no better than it was before. It could even be worse than before, or if we've entertained like years of anger and bitterness toward that person, or toward the circumstance. If anything, time could make the wounds worse. Yeah, I mean, it's like you said, you know, time alone will not heal things. There are certain things or circumstances or what have you where the past comes back to haunt you, whether it be a certain song, a certain color, uh, somebody touches you in a certain way. I was breaking down a cabinet the other day in one of the closets in the, the church. And there was a ball peen hammer that was sitting there. And so I'm like, well, this will be fun. I'm going to break this down with the ball peen hammer. (laughs) And, you know, all of a sudden in the middle of that, and I hadn't thought about this since I was a kid, that my brother used to sing a song about hitting people with a ball peen hammer, which was (laughs) a weird thing to to (laughs) sing, but, 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 but just something as random as picking up a ball peen hammer I remember a song that my brother used to sing 40 years ago. Prompted that memory. Yeah. And the memory is strong and strange. And it's like you said, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone away, passed away, the new has come. And so who has the power to address the past? Jesus does, because he has the power to make the old go away and the new come. Now, do we play a part of that? Sure, we have to work at it. We have to do our our part. But time doesn't have power over us. Christ has power over us. And so we have to allow Christ to work in our lives. And eventually our hurts, our hangups, our trauma, Christ has a way of remedying those through the power of his forgiveness in our lives. So what are some helpful biblical things that people can do to help overcome their past? Again, kind of going back to that other question where we distinguished between If we have a guilty past, if it's something that we did that was wrong versus if we were sinned against and maybe we were more innocent, that certainly plays into this answer. If we have been guilty in the guilty past, again, we need to choose to believe that God is going to forgive us or has the ability to forgive us. We need to repent and ask for forgiveness, one of God and potentially of the other person. But then also thinking about if you were innocent and sinned against, there are things to do too. Forgive the perpetrator, you know, meditate on God's character, just trusting God in general, understanding if we have any sin, like unforgiveness or bitterness, that that hurts our relationship with God and with other people. So that may need to be addressed as well. Yeah, the past can often be complicated because yes. there's a lot of heart work that needs to be done in a lot of different areas. In the case of if you you sinned against somebody, then you, yeah, you've got to go and you've got to ask for forgiveness in, mm-hmm. in somebody's life. But then there may be people that have sinned against you and you need to work on forgiving them. Right. And then, unfortunately, there's a lot of the world that things just happen because the world is broken. There's a, a miscarriage that's happened in a, a woman's life or a child gets ill or a tornado happens and you you lose your home. Right. Or somebody sets fire to your business. I mean, which is a real instance that has happened in, in Evansville. That's hard. That's very hard. It's very hard to, to deal with that circumstance. I, I think out of all those scenarios that we've talked about, somebody has sinned against you or you sinned against somebody, the remedies for those are pretty clear. Either you need to go forgive somebody or you need to grant forgiveness to somebody. I mean, that's the remedy for those two ultimately. But when you're dealing about with just general sin in the world, that's a lot harder to deal with and and to contemplate why God allows 
broken things in a broken world, that's harder to, to understand and harder to deal with. And sometimes people just never get past that and never get over that. But our heart attitude needs to be like Joseph, that regardless of what comes, if we are in Christ, he is doing all things and working all things together for his glory and his good for the glory of his name. We're just a small part of that. And one day when we're in heaven, we'll see all that. But to try to combine that verse and process that verse with real life experience is probably the most difficult step if you're dealing with the past. Yeah, that can be a lot to wrestle through. And I think a lot of times we're limited by our perspective and we assign truth to the world or truth to God according to what we understand. And that's very limited. Yeah. Or we assign emotion to God because of things that we've gone through. Like we assume that God hates us because our t- tornado has happened. That isn't true. And th- that's really difficult to deal with. So what would you do with somebody who has that type of issue with generally the world being broken? I mean, how, how do we counsel that person well? I think, of course, always going to God's word for instruction. I think of Job, you know, Job who loved God and hated evil and lived a godly life, but a lot of bad things happened to him. So... I think one of the first things I would do is look a lot at God's character Mm. and understanding who he is and his attitude towards us, which you've mentioned already, as far as he loves to help us. He has a father heart toward us. He cares, cares about every detail of our life and just really focus on learning more about that and meditating on that and then trusting him, even though the world is a mess. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's preparation for future things that can happen too, because we need to be in that relationship following him and trusting him for going forward because tough things will happen again more than likely. There's a weird little story in the New Testament where some people come up to Jesus and ask the question, a building fell on some people. People came up to Jesus and they asked him, so did that building fall on the people because they sinned? And Jesus said, no, absolutely not. It's it's not because they sinned or previous generation sinned or anything like Mm -hmm. that. It's something's just happened in the world just due to general sinfulness. Yeah. And, you know, one day, and our our hope is that God will rescue the world from that and rescue the world out of that. I think having the hope of heaven. Yes. That God is not going to leave us here in this state helps a lot. Yes, it sure does. (laughs) (laughs) We have that hope to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. And I think part of the challenge is helping people get out of their own head or they're out of their own circumstances and see that there is hope that is in Christ, that your father in heaven is not the way that you think that he is. He is making all things new right now, including you and your life. And there'll be a day where all things are really made new. And that's going to be a really great day. Yes, it will be. Thanks for tuning in to the Northwoods Church Matters podcast. If you'd like to find out more about Northwoods Church, you can visit us at our website, www.northwoodschurch.org. Again, that's www.northwoodschurch.org.